So um, we're going to have a few lessons on the historical data uh, on the resurrection of Jesus. Historical data on the resurrection of Jesus. And this was the reason... <clears throat> um, let me give you a quote here from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 14. First Corinthians 15 and 14. <clears throat> so it says, Paul is uh, arguing with some of these people that claim that there's no resurrection of the dead. And so he creates an argument. He says, well, there's a problem with what you're saying, because if you say there's no resurrection of the dead, then you're saying that not even Jesus was resurrected. And if you say that, then our faith is completely worthless. So here's what he says, verse 14. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We're found to be misrepresenting God then because we testify about God that he raised Christ from the dead, whom he did not raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. If the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. So one of the talking points, guys, is I always direct a conversation about anything. Carbon dating, dinosaurs, um, <clears throat> whether or not God could ever become a man, evolution versus creation, whether or not you believe in miracles. Any of these topics, I'll always direct them back to the resurrection of Christ because Paul has said, if Christ didn't resurrect from the dead, then everything is futile. Nothing matters. Yeah, all of Christianity, the Bible, evolution, creation, Genesis, all of it falls apart if, if Jesus did not resurrect from the dead. And so that's what I like to do is take people to the resurrection. Let's look at the historical data that we have about the resurrection and then see if we can come to a conclusion. So let's start off we're going to start in John's Gospel, John chapter 19, and we're going to read verses 17 through 37, this first text. <clears throat> John chapter 19 and verse 17. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on either side, Jesus between them. Pilate, now I want you to put a circle around Pilate because he's one of the ones that we're looking at. We're going to pay attention to the details of this account. Pilate wrote an inscription <clears throat> and put it on the cross and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. <laughs> Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Aramaic, and in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. But Pilate answered them and said, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic, but the tunic was seamless. It was woven in one piece from the top to the bottom. So they said to one another, let's not tear this, but let's cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. And this was to fulfill the scriptures. Might be worth, worth circling that fulfillment of scripture here. They divided my garments amongst them and from my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture. Here's another fulfillment of scripture. I thirst. 
A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch, and they held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Now since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. I would circle verse 35 there, because this is what we're going to hang our hat on. He who saw it has borne witness. The one that saw the soldier stab him and saw the water and the blood come out of the wound. The person that saw it is bearing witness. His testimony is true. He knows that he's telling the truth so that you also might believe. For these things all took place so that the scripture, again, another scripture being fulfilled, not one of his bones will be broken, and another scripture that says they will look on him whom they have pierced. So the first item of interest as we're looking at our text, John here is saying that he was an eyewitness, that he saw it, and he's telling the truth about um, testifying to it. John was one of the 12 apostles that Jesus spent his three-year ministry with. Uh, in order to be one of the apostles, you had to have been with Jesus from the time he was baptized all the way up until the time that he died. So one of the 12 is John, the apostle that Jesus loved. Uh, John, we have five of the manuscripts that John wrote. John wrote one gospel, the gospel of John. They call it the fourth gospel. John wrote three epistles. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and John wrote one apocalypse, which we call Revelation. So John, we have five of the manuscripts that John wrote, and I want to take a quick look at the uniqueness of each one where John makes it clear that I am an eyewitness to all the things that I'm telling you about. Uh, the first one I want to look at is in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. 1 John Chapter 1, verse 1. The reason John writes his epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, is because there was a heresy that was happening during his time where people were beginning to say Jesus wasn't a real man. He was just an image that got crucified, but it wasn't a real person. Strange, I know, but if you think back, during this first century, people were still believing in myths. Mythology was a real thing in this first century. So people were believing in all kinds of strange things. And so one of them was that Jesus was just a, an imagine, uh, something you could, a phantom, something you could see, but not a real physical person, and denying especially that he was God, because God could never become a human being. It was impossible. So in the midst of all that problem, John writes his epistle, and here is what he says in order to counteract what people were saying falsely about Jesus. John 1, 1 and verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we looked upon and we touched with our own hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it, and we testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father, and he has been made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we now proclaim to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father. So what we saw, what we heard, what we touched with our own hands, what we witnessed with our very eyes, we have proclaimed it to you and we've written it down. 
The third one uh, that John gives us, let's go back to John's Gospel, John chapter 19 and verse 32. John 19 and verse 32. And so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the one I already read. Uh, John 21, 20. That's what I meant. John 21, 20. Yeah. Uh, In this section, now this is, uh, Jesus has already been crucified. He's already been resurrected. And he meets the apostles uh, on the shore of the beach while the apostles are out fishing. And when the apostles recognize him, Peter jumps in the water and swims over to Jesus, and Jesus had breakfast ready for everybody. And then Jesus and Peter go for a walk, and John, the one that is writing all these things, is following and can hear what's being said between Jesus and Peter. So on this little walk along the beach is going to be Jesus and Peter, and John is going to be following them. So John documents the following, verse 20. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had also leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? That was John. When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Yeah. And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remains until I come, What is that to you? You follow me. And then in verse 24 is our main statement. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things, who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So three times John tells us in his manuscripts, I saw these things and I'm writing them down so that you will believe that they really happened. That's where we begin our story. the precedent is that we have an eyewitness testimony who witnessed Jesus, saw him crucified, saw him resurrected. Today, I just want to deal with the death of Jesus, just the crucifixion. And just the fact that our text, our manuscript is telling us that I saw this with my own eyes It automatically categorizes the manuscripts as a particular type of literature. In a court of law, when somebody holds up a document and says, we have a sworn eyewitness testimony, that document um, gets put through a test. In a court of law, they'll wonder, well, is there any other corroborating evidence that the statements made in this document are true? Is there anything corroborating this? And when we're studying history, there's also uh, what's called the bibliographic test, and we'll get into that. But for first, I want to look for corroborating evidence. Uh, so this is John's manuscripts, the Bible, and somebody might say, well, um, there's all kinds of conclusions. That's just mythology. Those are just stories that have been handed down. That's a fairy tale. But we all know when you read a fairy tale, uh, the the girl that kissed a toad. What was that? Jack and the Beanstalk. When you read a fairy tale, we know it's a fairy tale because we recognize the genre. When you read a myth, we know it's a myth. Nobody thinks that uh, Odysseus was a real person. Odysseus and the Odyssey. Uh, if you read Homer's Iliad, but. This can't be any of those genres because John is saying, I was an eyewitness, I saw these things, and I'm writing them down so that other people can believe that what I saw is real. So we'll treat this like a sworn testimony, and we're going to look for, is there any corroborating evidence outside of the Bible that will justify what we just read? So I want to go through a few of them for you at the corroborating evidence Let me give you the first one. A guy named Josephus. Josephus gave us what's called the Antiquities of the Jews. Uh, Chapter 18, section 3, and verse 3. Uh, Josephus lived between 37 and 100 A.D., so about the same time as Christ. 
surely the same time as the New Testament was being written. New Testament was written between about 50 and 96 uh, AD. So he was alive for all of this. He was a historian, but during the Jewish Roman Wars, 66 through 70, uh, rather than be killed, Josephus defected from the Jews and went out and allied with the Romans. The Romans uh, allowed him to document and become a, a historian. He was given citizenship and freedom under Titus. Titus is the one that went in and actually destroyed Jerusalem. Titus gave him citizenship and freedom after the destruction of Jerusalem, and he was allowed to keep a history of the Jewish Roman wars. So let me read to you what Josephus, the historian in that first century, writes. Chapter 18, verses 63 through 64. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it's lawful to call him a man, because he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to himself many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again on the third day. And as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him and the tribe of Christians so named after him are still not extinct even to this day. I think what I'll do once we've covered more material, guys, is I'll, I'll, I need to make a booklet and give you guys copies of all the manuscripts and all these things that I have documented because it's something you could actually show somebody. So I'll end up making a book, but... For now, I'll just read them to you. So one of the greatest historians in that first century, Josephus, uh, documents that Pilate did condemn Jesus to die on the cross. The next one is the actually the most important Roman historian of the first century. His name is Tacitus. Tacitus wrote something called the Annals. Um, he lived in that first century as well, from 50 to 120 A.D., he was a senator in the Roman Empire, and he was a historian of the Roman Empire. And he, Tacitus in his annals, records the reigns of Tiberius, Claudius, Nero, and those who reigned in the year of the four emperors, which was 69 AD. And so Tacitus, in his History of Rome, writes the following. Um, he's documenting about Nero burning, getting blamed for burning Rome down. And so what Nero does is Nero blames the Christians for burning Rome, and he punishes them as a result. So here's what Tacitus records. This is in the Annals, chapter 15 and verse 44. Neither human resourcefulness nor the emperor's largesse nor appeasement of the gods could stop belief in the nasty rumor that an order had been given for the fire. So nothing could stop the rumor that Nero had started the fire in Rome. To dispel the gossip, Nero therefore found culprits on whom he inflicted the most exotic punishments. These were people that were hated for their shameful offenses, whom the common people called Christians. The man who gave them their name, Christus, had been executed during the rule of Tiberius, by the procurator Pontius Pilate, and so on and so forth. So the most important Roman historian in the first century records that Pontius Pilate executed Jesus uh, by crucifixion. One other one in passing, uh, Lucian of Samosata lived in the second century A.D. Um, there was an individual named Peregrinus, who must have been a very popular person in the second century, an affluent person, and he converted over to Christianity. When he converted over to Christianity, this man Lucian uh, mocked him for the change that overtook him as a result of becoming a Christian. And so this second century author writes the following 
about this individual who became a Christian. To mock his conversion to Christianity. He says, during this period, Peregrinus, the, the guy that converted to Christianity, associated himself with the priests and the scribes of the Christians in Palestine and learned of their astonishing wisdom. Of course, in a short time, he made them look like children. He was their prophet, their leader, the head of the synagogue, and everything all by himself. He explained and commented on some of their sacred writings, and he even wrote some himself. They looked up to him as a god. They made him their lawgiver, they chose him as the official patron of their group, or at least the vice patron. He was second only to the one whom they still worship today, the man in Palestine who was crucified. Because he brought this new form of initiation into the world, having convinced themselves that they were immortal and would live forever, the poor wretches despised death and most willingly gave themselves over to it. Moreover, the first lawgiver of theirs persuaded them that they were all brothers, and the moment they transgressed and denied the Greek gods and began worshiping the crucified sophist and living by his laws. So he records um, within about 70 years of Christ's death uh, that people were already worshiping that crucified individual that was crucified in Jerusalem. So I gave you three references. There, there's a couple more, but I think that's enough just to set the precedence. So far, we've had the two greatest historians of the first century corroborating uh, what John wrote in his gospel and his epistle. I want to talk to you about the biographical, bibliographic test. When we have ancient manuscripts, there's a way that they decide how uh, viable the manuscripts are. And so there's two tests that they give ancient manuscripts. The first is how many copies do you have? The second test is how, is that, how old, uh, from the time he wrote it to the first copies that we have available today. How much time has passed from the time he wrote it until the first manuscripts that we still have today. Okay, So we'll take a look at this. Hey, quit calling me. Okay, so let's look at test number one, the bibliographic test for manuscripts. Test number one, how many copies do we have? Plato, Plato, one of the philosophers. Everybody seems to believe in Plato. Uh, now, here's what's strange. Originally, I had that they only had seven copies of anything Plato wrote. But every since the claims of how well attested the New Testament is. Wait till I, I explain how many copies of the New Testament we have. With the rise in the claims of how many copies of the New Testament we have, all of a sudden people have been digging deep and researching these other Greek authors to see if they could turn up more copies of their versions. So it's hard to know. So I'm going to put Plato at 200 copies. That's the biggest number I could find. Other numbers I found were seven copies. So Plato, we have, let's say, 200 copies of his works. Uh, Plato was one of the most important philosophers, along with Socrates, Aristotle. Plato founded, uh, laid the foundations of the Western philosophy and science. Plato uh, was a founder of the Western political philosophy with his Republic. And so the most copies of his manuscripts we have is 200 copies. Tacitus, the most important historian of the first century. We have 31 copies of Tacitus' works. 31 copies of his manuscripts. Next would be Homer. Homer ranks as one of the biggest ones. Homer gave us the Odyssey and the Iliad. We have 643 of Homer's manuscripts. So anywhere from a couple hundred manuscripts to 600. Nobody ever doubts these people as being true. Nobody ever doubts these people as being genuine. Some of these might be copies. This would be something he made. Of course, realizing in this first century, everybody hand wrote copies. No printing machines. So, uh, yeah, 
How many copies do we have, ancient copies of those documents? Uh, so 643 really maxes out the best attested events, and, and Homer is, is usually that guy. When we come to the New Testament, uh, we have 5,900 Greek copies. 5,900 Greek manuscripts. Uh, if you include all the other manuscripts that were translated into other languages, if I remember correctly, it comes to about 10,000. I can't remember that number. But you compare 200 for Plato. What was Tacitus? 31 for Tacitus. And... Good job. 643 for Homer. 5,900 just in the Greek language of the New Testament. So, was, was it written in that time in other, other languages? Yeah. Yeah, it was translated into a lot of other languages. Was it really written in the Greek? Yes. Why? Greek was the world language at the time. Greek was the English. <laughs> Greek was the English. Before Greek, it was... Uh, Aramaic, I'm pretty sure Aramaic was the, the, the language. So that's... Um, Do you have documents that say that? Tacitus. The second test is how far a difference is it from the day it was written until the first copy that we have. So Plato wrote in 400. Plato wrote in 400. And the first copies we have of his manuscripts, the earliest one, is 895. So that puts us A.D., sorry, A.D., this is B.C. So somebody does the math there, 1,300 years. The first manuscript we have of Plato is 1,300 years after the original manuscript. When it comes to Tacitus, Tacitus wrote in 100 A.D. The earliest writings we have from him is 850 A.D. So that's 750 years after his original writing. Homer wrote in 800 B.C. And the first ones we have of him is 400 B.C. So there's 400 years from the original. The New Testament, John, the one that we just read, was written in about 90 A.D. But the whole New Testament, we're going to put it between 50 and 96 A.D. John wrote the Gospel around 90 A.D. The earliest document we have of John's Gospel is called P52. It dates to 125 A.D. So if John wrote it in 90 and the earliest known document we have of it is at 125. How many years difference is there? Uh, John, wrote, John wrote his gospel in 90. Sorry. There's 35 years difference between the earliest copy we have and the day that John actually wrote his gospel. These kinds of numbers are just um, amazing. And um, there was one commentator that said, when you look at the amount of New Testament manuscripts that we have, with the amount of time in between the original and the copy, none of ancient antiquity can compare to what the evidence that we have and the, the sooner it was written, the more likely it would be, be credible. The closer to the original date you can be, the less likely it's been, the less likely adulterated. It's been adulterated. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And then 35 years for the New Testament. So, really, uh, the New Testament passes the bibliographical test, which is the test they use to say, can we trust these documents? And that applies for any ancient document. So the bibliographic test, as far as how many copies do we have, 
and how close to the original is it, nothing in all of antiquity uh, supersedes the, Testament, the, the New Testament. Scrutiny of the manuscripts. I want to read what, uh, based on that data, right, which is what we're talking about, what I, what I wanted to give you guys and, and other people that are not as familiar with the story, uh, what's the data? Cold, hard data, because everybody likes the scientists, the scientific process. The scientific process. What's the data? And then what's our conclusion? So here's what people have concluded based on the information that I've shared with you. Uh, John's eyewitness testimony, the corroboration of, his, of historian, Roman historians, and then the attestation of the bibliographies. Here's what some people have said. Uh, the journal, and this would be kind of fun to look up, guys. I have a copy of it, but I would have had 30 pages each if I would have photocopied all this. I would look this up. The Journal of American Medical Association. Journal of the American Medical Association. They published an article on the physical death of Jesus Christ. On the physical death of Jesus Christ. It's a PDF on the internet, so I would look that up. That is a good, good read. That was published in 1986. The Journal of American Medical Association got together to analyze um, the crucifixion and what, that, what Jesus would have undergone. And so here is a couple of the quotes from that document. First, uh, can we trust the Bible manuscripts? And here's what they said. Using the legal historical method of scientific investigation, scholars have established the reliability and the accuracy of the ancient manuscripts. Pretty big statement for a secular magazine. So we got our information from the scriptures and from other sources, and our scientific approach has said, has verified the reliability and the accuracy of these manuscripts. Another quote is, the credibility of any discussion of Jesus' death will be determined primarily by the credibility of one's sources. For this review, the source material includes the writings of ancient Christians and non-Christian authors, the writings of modern authors and the Shroud of Turin, Using the legal historical method of scientific investigation, scholars have established the reliability and the accuracy of the ancient manuscripts. And the last quote from that um, article, clearly, this is their summary, clearly the weight of historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was ever inflicted and supports the traditional view that the spear, which was thrust between his right ribs, probably perforated not only the right lung, but also the pericardium and the heart, and thereby ensured his death. Accordingly, interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. So the Journal, the journal of the American Medical Association says that the Jesus was crucified and that he did die as a result of his crucifixion. Scrutiny of the manuscripts. Uh, John Warwick uh, was the founder of a law school in Canada, and he compared the amount of data that's available, the historical data available about Jesus. And he says, to be skeptical of the resultant text of the New Testament book is to allow all of classical antiquity to slip into obscurity because no document of the ancient period are as well attested bibliographically as the New Testament. There's no part of Roman history that we believe today. Julius Caesar, the Battle of Carthage, Spartacus, 
any of the things that we know to be facts in history, none of those are as well attested bibliographically as the crucifixion of Jesus. Something to be said. If somebody wants to reject the crucifixion, they'd have to reject all of ancient antiquity. <clears throat> Lee Strobel was uh, a newspaper editor. Lee Strobel was educated at the Yale School of Law. Uh, Lee Strobel was the legal editor for the Chicago Tribune, and he was an atheist until he had to investigate the death of Jesus in 1981. In 1998, he published his findings in a book called The Case for Christ. Has anybody seen that movie? Read the book? Read the book? You, uh, you ought to see if you can find the movie. I think it's on Netflix, maybe? I don't know. But it's been made into a movie, and it's moving. Not as, not as well documented as the book. The book is a definitely an important read. So he publishes in this book, A Case for Christ, a journalist's personal investigation of the evidence of Jesus. And here's what he summarized at the end. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the best attested event of the ancient world. In 2017, the movie was the book was made into a movie called A Case for Christ. So just a summary of what we've looked at. Uh, the data that we've presented so far says that John's account, his eyewitness account of the crucifixion has been corroborated by several of the most important historians of his day. The reliability of the extant manuscripts and evidence far surpasses any of the best attested events in ancient history. The number of manuscripts that we have constitutes an embarrassment of riches. This term, embarrassment of riches, was coined by Bruce Metzger. Bruce Metzger was one of the editors of the Greek uh, manuscripts of the New Testament. Another guy named Bart Ehrman co-authored the book. Has anybody ever heard of Bart Ehrman? Bart Ehrman used to be at the top of the game in apologetics for Christianity. And then I don't know what happened in his life, but he left Christianity. And now he says Christianity is just nothing real about it. But at one time he was at the height of his game. And I want to read a quote from their book. It's called, the book was called The Text of the New Testament. And he says, in contrast with these in contrast with these figures, which deal with other Greco-Roman literature, the textual critic of the New Testament is embarrassed by the wealth of material that we have. Before he fell away and started teaching against Jesus, he is quoted as having said, um, compared to other Greco-Roman literature, the critics of the New Testament have an embarrassing amount a wealth of material. And so the conclusion from the data is that the New Testament bears witness to the truth of history. And I think that's where I'll stop for this first phase. This first lecture is just establishing the undeniable data verifying Pontius Pilate sentenced Jesus to crucifixion on the cross, and eyewitnesses testify to it, corroborating evidence testifies to it, and the manuscripts have been proven to be more substantial than any other event in all of ancient history.